Hello, everyone. My name is Alexander Konarski, and I am a lead educator here at Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium. I want to thank you all for joining us today as we move into our second live stream for the month of December, where we are continuing our theme of world wildlife conservation. If you're new here, then welcome. Along with the live streams we do every month, we also offer a really cool and free virtual scavenger hunt app that you can play right at home, along with an activity guide, both that have new missions and activities each month. To download the app and explore all of this, just hop on over to www.wondersofwildlife.org forward slash mission dash conservation. This address will take you to our mission conservation webpage. On this page, check the box to the right, it's that little tiny blue one. It says, get the app. Just click the download button and follow the instructions. Once you have that app downloaded, create a user account and a login. It's super easy, it won't take you any time at all. In that search bar, you're gonna to wanna to type mission conservation. This is where all of our at home missions will pop up for you to play. If you look a little bit further down, you're gonna see the featured missions. The featured missions part is the most current missions that we have to offer. This is where you're gonna see things like Smokey the Bear and our current mission, World Wildlife Conservation. The very last place I wanna bring your guys' attention to is at the very bottom. So make sure you scroll all the way to the bottom of the page. This is where you're gonna find the schedule of missions and activities. This section is gonna show you all the missions that are live, including our current mission, World Wildlife Conservation. And if you click on the plus sign, it's gonna drop down on the tab. And this is where you're gonna find the link to the activity guide that I mentioned earlier for this month. The activity guide is gonna have a craft as well as a really cool and fun outdoor activity. This is also the section where you're gonna be able to find many of our partners' missions descriptions. Currently, I'm standing in front of our prairie chicken and grouse diorama here in the Wonders of Wildlife Wildlife Galleries. This is our natural history museum portion. And behind me, you may notice individuals taking flight or even down here showing displays of dominance for territory and mating. Today, we're gonna to be talking all about birds. We will be discussing various topics such as, what are birds? Where do they travel? what types of challenges they face, and conservation efforts dedicated just for them. Joining us today to talk about all of this is Austin Lambert. Some of you may remember Austin, but for those of you newbies, welcome. And Austin is a naturalist, which is a person who studies the natural world. Naturalists make observations of the relationships between organisms, their environment, as well as how those relationships change over time. So without further ado, let's get into it. Austin, how are you doing out there today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me there, Alexander. Um, well, again, my name is Austin, and I'm a naturalist with the Missouri Department of Conservation, coming out of the Runge Conservation Nature Center, which is a nature center here in Jefferson City, Missouri. Now, I really love Runge because it's a great place to come and learn all about nature. But of course, it's not the best place to learn about nature. The best place is actually getting outside and experiencing nature. And so after our little program today, I do challenge you to get outside, and hopefully you can see some birds and some different things that we're talking about today. Now, I did briefly mention that I'm a part of the Missouri Department of Conservation. And the Missouri Department of Conservation's mission is to protect and manage Missouri's fish, forest, and wildlife resources, and to get people outside to use, learn about, and enjoy those different resources. And so I'm very happy to be with all of you today and talk about one of my very favorite topics, which is birds. So I know a lot of you are very familiar with birds and probably see birds on a regular basis, probably daily, I would guess. Um, but you know, have you really stopped to think about uh, what a bird is and some of the different conservation challenges that those birds might be facing? And so to kick things off, I want you to picture a bird in your head. What type of bird is it? You might be thinking about something like a duck or a crow or a robin or a cardinal or maybe something like an eagle. So all those different animals are birds. But what features do those animals have in common? What makes a bird a bird? So when you're picturing those birds, you might be looking at some different features. So we might look at something like a beak, and all birds do have a beak or a bill. Uh, but you know, there's lots of other animals out there that also have beaks, including things like turtles. When we think about birds, we also think about animals that lay eggs. And of course, there's many other animals that also lay eggs, including most reptiles, uh, many different species of fish, amphibians, insects. You know, so that's not something that's all that unique either. We might be thinking of something that's bipedal. That means they have two legs, but I just so happen to have two legs as well, and I am not a bird. Other things we can think about are things like wings. All birds do have wings, whether they fly or not. Even when we're talking about things like ostriches or penguins still have wings. 
Um, but you know, bats have wings, insects have wings. So again, something that's not all that unique to birds. The most unique feature that makes a bird a bird is the presence of feathers, because all birds have feathers and only birds have feathers. So whenever you see an animal out there, regardless of the color that has feathers, they're absolutely 100% going to be a bird and only a bird. So we have all these birds out there, of course. Um, when we're looking at different species of birds, of course, there's many different types. We mentioned ducks and eagles and a lot of these different types of birds, but just here in Missouri alone, there are over 400 species of birds that we can find uh, that have been in Missouri at least at one point in time. During the typical year, we might find about 330 different species, and we have about 170 different species that breed here in the state of Missouri. In North America, we have over 900 species of birds that we could possibly find. And when you look north of Mexico, we have closer to 2,000 species they can potentially find. So when I talk about North America originally, we're talking about north of Mexico. But if you include Mexico, our diversity goes up quite a bit. The smallest bird that we have in Missouri is the ruby-throated hummingbird, which is a little bit smaller than my thumb and weighs a little bit more than a penny. The largest bird that we have in Missouri is a trumpeter swan, and they can weigh up to 30 pounds, a pretty good sized bird. The most plentiful bird in the world is the red-billed quiglia, uh, which is a type of weaver that we find living in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. And there's about 1.5 billion individual uh, quick quiglias, red-billed quiglias out there in the world. But if we looked at the absolute most plentiful bird, then we don't want to look at the wild anymore. We would look at our very own domestic chicken. And there's about 23 billion chickens out there in the world, which is about three for every person that's out there. So there's quite a few different birds, especially a lot of those chickens. And when we look at the worldwide, me. Uh, we look worldwide, there's about 10,000 different species of birds out there in the world. So many, many different birds. So we have all these different birds. Where can we find these birds? Well, there's lots of different places that we can potentially look in order to find birds. Uh, we might look in like a forest. We could potentially look in something like a prairie area. Uh, we might also go to like a wetland in order to find those birds. And so you can go to some very exotic locations in order to find birds, but you can even go to your very own backyard, which is one of the very best places to go out and look for birds. And I love for looking at looking at birds in my very own backyard. But you know, even those birds that I find in my backyard are not just my backyard birds. Because birds are so mobile, they can fly around to a variety of different places. And so some of the birds that I see in my yard, including things like the indigo bunting, which is this bright blue colored bird up here, um, not only is it in my yard, but also migrates down to Central and, and South America. And so they fly quite a way. So even when I'm looking at the birds in my yard and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about these birds, I also need to consider all the other places that they also live. So if I can serve them in my yard, that's great. But really, this is a global thing, which I think fits very well into our worldwide um, conservation. And so we have all these birds and learning about them, I think is a, a lot of fun because they are fantastic creatures. Uh, but you know, there's a reason that we're talking about them. And that's because many bird populations are not doing very well. There's a study that came out a couple of years ago uh, that took some data starting in the 1970s until today, where they were going out there and they were doing surveys of birds. And they found that just in, in uh, the United States and Canada, there's about 2.9 billion fewer birds today than there was in 1970, which is quite a drop. Now I know 2.9 billion is a very hard number to go out there and imagine. Uh, but just for reference, there's about 8 billion people in the world, not quite 8 billion people. So if you took like eight of your friends and then three of them just disappeared, you know, you would be kind of upset. And this is kind of upsetting that we lost all these birds. So what exactly happened? Well, there's a few things going on there. The biggest thing that's affecting our bird populations are things like habitat loss. And so there's quite a few different species of birds that, uh, especially grassland birds, that have lost quite a bit of habitat out there uh, in the Midwest and throughout much of the world. And so their population since 1970 has dropped about 50%, which is pretty dra dramatic. Now it's not just grasslands being turned into farm row crops and things like that, uh, but we're losing grasslands for a variety of different, different reasons. Um, you know, and we, we don't think as much about it, but even our lawn, uh, you know, a nice neat lawn is not very good bird habitat. So that also re represents bird habitat being lost. So if we look at that little graph there on the right, we notice that there's uh, some forest birds that have took a little bit of a dip, about 17%, and again, over 50% for grassland birds. And while I'm looking at the state of Missouri, originally Missouri was mostly prairie grassland and forest. And so those are a lot of those birds that we're referring to. So birds are definitely in trouble. Now, why should we care about this? You know, we know it's happening, but uh, what do birds do for us that's so very important? 
Well, one thing that they offer is ecosystem services. And so they're going out there and they are actually doing things for free that benefit us. Uh, one great example is that barn swallow, which we have on the upper left-hand side there. And that barn swallow can eat 60 insects an hour and over 800 insects during the course of a day. And that's insects including things like mosquitoes. So I really, really love barn swallows. We can also look at indicator species. Those species that uh, when they are present tell us that the habitat is fairly healthy. So Swainson's warbler is a very good example of that because they like to live in some of our giant cane areas that we have down in Southern Missouri. And so we find those species down in those canes. We know that that species is being present, uh, tells us that the habitat is fairly healthy. And it's also very good for tourism. So we don't have a whole lot of greater prairie chickens left in the state of Missouri and people are willing to travel uh, and pay money to see them. Um, sometimes birds can be a little wacky like that, but that's how passionate they are about birds. Just like people can be passionate about so many other things. Uh, an example that hits a little bit closer to home is there's that common red pole, which is uh, kind of in the lower left-hand side of our screen there. And that common red pole was actually taken, that picture was actually taken at my home bird feeders. And so that's a fairly rare species for the state of Missouri. And I had people calling me up and uh, uh, texting me and sending me emails wondering if they can come visit my yard to come look at that bird. And I hosted a couple dozen people out there to come see that bird. And, and luckily, most of them were successful. But they're willing to travel across the state. And in doing so, they're spending money. They're buying uh, food locally and doing uh, different things like that. So very important for tourism. There's also a huge cultural, artistic, and scientific significance to this as well. And so, you know, we've heard about like the white storks uh, dropping off uh, uh, babies, uh, which is a, a something that's a legend or myth that started out, out in Europe. And uh, so we don't have white storks in North America, but we're all very familiar with that. Uh, and we can even look at things like, again, more towards science. So when we look at how to make planes go faster. We look at things like the peregrine falcon, the way that it's built, being the fastest bird in the world, especially designed for going very, very quickly. So that can be used for some type of inspiration for making those planes go faster. Birds are also very important for, uh, for us to eat. So we talked about the, uh, the 23 billion chickens that are out there. Uh, most of those are food chickens, but even some more wild birds, things like a wild turkey, a variety of waterfowl can also be eaten. And then I also think that we should care about birds just because they're a form of art and nature's diversity. You know, they're so very beautiful to go out there and look at. Uh, and, and with so many different species of birds, they really, really do show um, how all this uh, evolution over time has worked and, and giving us all these different species. So lots of reasons that we should care. So now let's say that we do care. Uh, what can we do to help? What are some steps that we can take uh, to go out there and help these birds? Well, there's several very simple steps out there. And uh, some of the steps that we can do, we can do things like keeping cats indoors. Every year, about 2.6 billion birds are killed by cats, which again, is quite a few birds. There's about 110 feral cats uh, both in the United States and in Canada. So they're going out there and do, they're doing a lot of damage to our environment. Uh, not only are they going out there and killing birds, but actually having those outdoor cats is not very healthy for them either. Typically outdoor cats have very short lifespans because things are so very dangerous. They're getting bites of their cats, they're getting eaten by a variety of things. Um, so by keeping cats indoors, we're not only protecting birds, but we're also protecting the pet cats that we, we care so much about. Now, if your cat really is dying to get outside, because I understand that some cats might enjoy that uh, outside time, you might look into something like a catio, which is a specially built little uh, ex uh, enclosure for cats where you can kind of decorate it up like a little parade playground for cats. You can stick them out there and then you're protecting birds, but you're also protecting your cats. We can also avoid things like single use plastics. And so when we're going out there and using straws and things like that, you know, those are things that we are, are absolutely necessary in most cases. So uh, avoid using single-use plastics. It's estimated there's about one point, um, I'm sorry, I lost my estimation there, but there's quite a few plastics out there and it especially affects things like seabirds. And so seabirds might fly around, they might see like a shiny um, plastic spoon or something like that floating in the ocean, fly down thinking it's a fish and that can actually choke up their crop. So they get too full of that plastic where they can't eat everything, anything else and they end up starving to death. So avoid single-use plastics. We can also do things to make windows and lighting a little bit safer for birds. So a lot of us might be familiar with birds flying into windows. It's estimated that approximately 1. billion birds die each year from striking a window. And so we can do things to cut down on the reflection of the window. And so if we look at that lower right-hand photo, we can see all those little tiny uh, cube-shaped stickers that are across that window. And that's to break down on that reflection so birds don't think that the window is the sky when they see it at just the right angle or they can't see from one window, look through the house and see out the under window and think it's a safe place to, to go out and uh, to fly through. So break up that outline. 
Now, those decals, usually you can see through those pretty easily and still see outside, so you can check out your birds. Uh, but even things like closing the shades helps break down on that reflection, so you're less likely to have some casualties um, from bird strikes. And same goes for lighting. As birds migrate, those lights that shine out your windows, your patio lights kind of throw off their migration. So shut the patio lights off or get an automatic uh, light that when somebody walks by, it turns on, so it's only on when it's needed. Um, and shut it off if it's not. And same thing, close those blinds at night to help conserve all the light inside your house without it waking out. So make windows and, and lighting birds safe. And we can also be a bird-friendly consumer. And so if you're a coffee drinker, go out there and drink bird-friendly coffee, uh, which is coffee that's grown in such a way that allows for greater habitat uh, to be down in, in Central and South America where more co coffee is grown. Uh, but even things like bird-friendly beef. So just be conscientious of what you're buying and how that might affect birds, not both locally and throughout the world. Other things that we can do. We can also do things like avoid uh, excessive use of pesticides. And so go out there and use it in a very targeted fashion. About 1 billion pounds of pesticides is applied to the US each year. Um, of course, that's lethal to insects, which is the whole point of putting the pesticide out there. But in many cases, that pesticide is directly lethal to birds as well. And so use that a little bit more sparingly or more, again, more targeted fashion. So those are all ways that birds might end up dying. We might keep them from dying. But of course, the major problem was habitat loss. So something else we can do is we can create habitat. There's about 40 million acres of lawn out there in the United States, which is a pretty large area, bigger than any national park. If we were to go out there and conserve even half of our lawn or a quarter of our lawn, we'd be making a huge difference for birds. So go out there and plant native plants in your yard, kind of reduce the area that you might have that's uh, dedicated to lawn, and just kind of generally be lazy. lazy. Don't mow quite so often. Uh, and again, those native plants are very, very, very important for birds because our insects that are native to the United States and Missouri uh, have evolved with those native plants. And so there was a very interesting study done by uh, Doug Talamine, who is a uh, entomologist at the University of Delaware, where he walked around one oak tree and he counted all the different caterpillar species that he can find at head height. And he counted 19 different species, uh, 410 individuals of those 19 different species on an oak tree. He did the same thing on a non-native Bradford pear and he found one caterpillar of one uh, individual species. And so there's a lot more caterpillars on that native uh, plant, which is very important. Because if we look at something like a chickadee, which is that bird that's on the upper left-hand side of our screen there, a clutch of chickadees, which is usually about three to four chickadees, needs about 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars in order just to fledge the nest. And that takes about 18 days for them to get out of that nest, and they need about six to 9,000 caterpillars during that time. So we need a lot of those insects, and those insects are directly tied to those native plants. So planting native plants, reducing lawn, and being a little bit lazier, not mowing a little bit less. Uh, we can also do things like support conservation agencies. And I don't just mean the Missouri Department of Conservation, but even nonprofits, things like uh, the Ottoman Society, um, uh, the Nature Conservancy, all sorts of different, uh, in, in a little bit more locally, things like uh, Missouri Prairie Foundation here in, here in Missouri. Uh, all, those, all those agencies go out there, and if they're adding habitat that is helping birds, or they can be conserving birds directly. So uh, support your conservation, because conservation does work. If we look at the lower right-hand side, since the 1970s, although we have lost quite a few birds, during that same time, we've been conserving waterfowl, raptors, and turkeys, and their populations have flourished. So conservation definitely does work. So some simple things that we can go out there and do uh, in order to help birds. Now, of course, another thing we can do is go out and watch birds and share what we're seeing with others. So using apps like eBird to report some of the birds that we do see. But since we're talking about watching birds, I think what we're gonna do next is we're going to switch over and we're actually gonna try and watch some birds. So right now I am at the Runge Nature Center and I'm standing in our wildlife viewing area, uh, which is a great place to come and see some birds. So we have a variety of different birds that are out here right now. Actually things are, are pretty hopping right now at the feeders. And so uh, in the middle of our screen here, I have some American goldfinches that are sitting right in the middle of this feeder. Um, and inside of that feeder are some cracked sunflower hearts. And so the inner portion of that sunflower meat, that seed, is what they're eating right now. Uh, and a few other birds kind of flying in and out. And so sunflowers are a great thing to go out there and feed birds. Now, some of you might be familiar with goldfinches. You know that they are not that gold color. And actually they have a winter plumage where they're not quite so colorful, which makes survival a little bit easier if you're not out there broadcasting yourself at all times. The birds that are kind of flying in and out of there, and keep on taking off and one just landed and took off, is a tufted titmouse. 
And so a touch of titmouse might look a little bit like a cardinal because it has a little crest on the back of its head, but it's a very, very different type of bird, much more related to a chickadee, which is the bird that just flew in and flew out there real quick. And things are happening so fast, which is fantastic. So a few more American goldfinches and another titmouse on top there flying around. Well, another bird that I want to point out real quickly is they're just starting to take off now and kind of walk out of here are these birds right here, which are birds that you don't typically see at your backyard bird feeder. Uh, but we have some wild turkeys that are walking through the area, uh, kind of taking off. Um, and so we had seven male turkeys out here for just a, a moment ago that are all kind of moving through and uh, decide that they've had enough of us for today. Uh, but a very interesting bird, um, one I think that a lot of us might be familiar with, even though we don't maybe see it all that often. Yeah. So again, lots of birds, another tufted of titmouse moving in there. We can see that little crest. Move over this closer feeder here where we might be able to see these birds just a little bit better. So tufted of titmouse on the right, we can see that crest, chickadee on the left. And so even though they do look different, they are very closely related. Like if you were to go through and pull off all the feathers, which is something that you don't want to do, of course, because that's very bad for the bird. We notice that their eyes are relatively the same size. They have the same uh, shaped beak and they have very, very large feet. Uh, and also their tail and wing feathers are in proportion to each other as well. So if you kind of take away all the colors, they do look very, very similar. And so those birds are in the same, in the same family, very, very closely related. We got some more stuff happening over here. Another titmouse moving in on those goldfinches. Another chickadee flying in. And so some of the things that you can offer in your backyard in order to attract birds, we already mentioned the sunflower seeds. So cracked sunflower seeds work very well, especially for things like finches, but you can tie whole sunflower seeds for not only gold finches, but a variety of other birds. Uh, in fact, if I only had to offer one type of food for birds to attract them to my yard, um, I would recommend black oil sunflower seeds, which work very, very well. Also in that little tray feeder where all those birds are, are jumping in there, I have some live mealworms which are really enticing for a lot of birds. Once they see those, they kind of get, uh, uh, get pretty excited to see those and they'll, they'll fly right in whenever they see them. Uh, because it's winter time, there's not a whole lot of insect activity out there and insects are very full of protein and lots of fats, which are things that they need this time of year. So good things to offer. Uh, we can also offer things like suet. And so in this square field that's kind of at the bottom of your screen, there's a suet cake inside of there. And a suet is something that's very, oh, we just had a nuthatch move in. We're gonna come back up here. So that's a white-breasted nuthatch that just came in, which is a very interesting bird. They have a long kind of needle-like beak, which is very good for pulling uh, insects out from between bark. And nuthatches are really famous for the ability to climb head first down a tree. And so a lot of birds, like things like woodpeckers, when they're searching for insects, they typically start at the base of a tree and they work their way up. So they're looking at insects from one direction. And that white-breasted nuthatch is looking for insects from a different perspective. So it's more like to find insects in a place that other birds might not be able to. So especially large feet but holding onto that tree as they go down, down head first. Uh, but I think we were talking about suet. And again, suet is a great way to go out there and uh, attract some birds because it's very high in fat, which is something that the birds especially are, are desiring during the winter time. And then I also I like to offer some peanuts. And there's a, a peanut feeder right over here. And it's a little bit quiet at the moment because there's so many other types of foods that are being offered. But our turkeys, which are just starting to move back right now, absolutely love peanuts because they're very, again, very high in fats and very high in proteins. Where's that turkey? There he is. So we have about seven toms that are kind of running around here. But real quick, they're coming back in. I want to pull back up here because we have Missouri state bird in the middle of our feeder there. So we have a chickadee in the front and we have an Eastern bluebird in the back. And bluebirds also love to go after those mealworms and they love suet. So there's all sorts of really good things in that feeder uh, for them because there's some, some suet pellets in there as well as the mealworms and the sunflower hearts. So that, I think they're very happy with that. And so a, a, uh, if you look very carefully at a bluebird, you notice the very large eye, the kind of plump body, that insect uh, catching bill. And so they're actually a type of, of thrush, which includes things like rabbits. And so if you can just kind of look at the general shape, the eyes, the feet, the bill, those types of things will tell you what family it belongs to. And then you can look at colors and things like that to figure out the individual species. So when we're identifying birds, things like size, shape uh, of both the bird and the individual parts is far more important than the color initially 
And then you kind of lean on color a little bit more as you, as you kind of narrow down your options of what bird it might be. So another turkey here. We also uh, have another little critter that's not quite a bird, but still a lot of fun to watch. Uh, back here on this log, there's an Eastern gray squirrel there. And we took some pumpkins that we had out from uh, fall decorations and threw them out there. And he's crawling in, inside and pulling out seeds and he's eating all the seeds out of the pumpkins. So also a lot of fun to watch these critters as they're, as they're uh, kind of jumping around our feeders and uh, uh, sometimes emptying them, but that's, a, that's okay. They're, they're welcome animals here at the nature center. So we can see a couple of turkeys eating some peanuts there. Another great thing about watching birds at the bird feeders, typically when I'm out in the woods or the wetlands or the prairies trying to look at birds, um, I'm trying to kind of run around and see as many different types of birds as I can possibly see. So I'm kind of running myself crazy, just going around, just trying to see a bird. And usually when I see a bird, I go, oh, great. And I'll check it off. I'll say, oh yeah, I found that uh, American goldfinch in the prairie and I'll check it off. And then I'll go try and find the next species. Typically when I'm looking at my bird feeder, that's a really good time to go out there and really study their behavior. So when we're watching these turkeys feed, you might notice they have a particular type of scratching pattern that they do, or they'll scratch back with both feet, uh, kind of taking a step backward as they do that, and then they'll feed forward into the area, the path of the, the food that they just scratched. So it's kind of on, on alert, it looks like. I'm very glad these guys decided to make a, make a little appearance there. And so of course we could watch birds at the bird feeder here all day. And I, I likely might after we're done with our little broadcast. Uh, but uh, you know, there's, there's other ways that we can also go out there and look at birds uh, besides just watching birds at our backyard bird feeder, which is fantastic. And so there's a variety of different citizen science efforts that we can take part in, uh, in order to, um, again, add, add a little bit of uh, uh, data to, that scientists might actually use when they're going out there and doing our research. We can do things like Christmas bird counts, which are ongoing right now until January 5th. So there's a bird, Christmas bird count here in the Jefferson City area uh, this last week, and as well as one up in Columbia, which is just north of this area a little ways. And people went out and they counted as many species of birds as they could find, and as many individuals of those species within a 15 mile radius circle. And so they're gonna do that continuously over many, many, many years. So they have a good uh, uh, frame of, of data. So they can kind of look at how the way things were in the past and the way that uh, their, things are kind of trending. Another uh, great um, count that's going on right now is Project Feeder Watch. So this is a count that you, can, you guys can do at home. Um, it's one that is, is uh, through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology as well as several other organizations where you go out there and you just count birds in your backyard. And so you choose usually two days a week and you count for at least 15 minutes during that week and count all the different individuals and different species that you see coming to your feeders. So another great one that we can, we can do. And then coming up in February is a great backyard bird count where we have several days to go out there. And again, same thing, go out there and count as many birds as you possibly can. But we can also do these things at our leisure. We can go out there and we can use things like eBird, which is a nice little app or website where you can go out there and document all the birds that you found. Uh, and even things like Merlin, which is a really great uh, app out there that not only lets you report the birds that you're finding, but also do things like uh, it helps you identify those birds. And so if you're a little bit uh, more, of a, more of a novice birder, which is fantastic, definitely get out there and do some birding. Merlin is a fantastic, fantastic app for you. So lots of different ways that we can get out there and conserve birds and definitely get out and enjoy and watch a lot of those birds. All right. Well, like I said, I think I can be out here all, all day, um, but you guys probably have some other stuff to do. So uh, thank you so much. And I think Alexander, I'm gonna pass it back off to you for the moment. Hey, that sounds great, Austin. That was a lot of awesome information. We do have like a couple minutes though. And I yeah, have sure. a couple part question here I wanna ask you. So yeah. while watching the, you know, the scope there and all the different bird feeders, I noticed that there was something going on underneath one of those. It looked kind of like this metal device at the bottom. This guy right here, huh? Yeah, can you tell us a little bit what, about what that is? Yeah, so I mentioned the squirrels that we have out here. Now, those squirrels are definitely welcome here at the Nature Center. Uh, they can empty a feeder in a hurry. So uh, this is a, a baffle, and a baffle is a device that you put on a feeder, and it keeps, um, I don't want to say nuisance animals, because again, they're welcome, but uh, animals that we don't want on our feeder quite so often, 
uh, it gives them a hard time to crawl up there. So things like raccoons would have a hard time climbing up there because they climb up the pole. And then they kind of go inside the baffle and can't or aren't quite usually athletic enough to get their way around the baffle. And so baffles typically work pretty good, though occasionally a uh, squirrel does outsmart us. And if we look down at this other feeder down here, also has a baffle, which is great, but the cedar tree right above it has grown just a little bit too long. And those squirrels being the athletes that they are can jump about six feet straight out, uh, which is almost as far as I could jump, which is pretty good for a little critter like that. And so, especially when they're jumping from a higher height, they can really travel some distance and get out there and, uh, and jump on those feeders. So, uh, but again, we're not gonna throw up, uh, or that's not gonna cause too many issues here at the nature center, but we do like to keep apples on our other feeders to hopefully prevent those squirrels from stealing a little more than their fair share of seed. Hey, that's awesome. And so here's the second part to that question. We've yeah. Got the baffle, and that's obviously what you guys use. Is there any other device or any other, oh, say, tip that you would give to somebody that's putting them in their backyard or bird feeders in their backyard, but doesn't necessarily have access to a baffle device? Is there anything else they can do? Yeah, so there's a, a variety of things that you can do. One thing uh, to keep in mind is, is where you place your bird feeders. And so you do want to be able to look out the window and see the birds because that's the whole, really the whole point of having the bird feeder. Uh, we like to think that we're helping birds when we put bird feeders out, but most cases we're, we're not necessarily helping, but we are getting them close to us where we can see them and enjoy them. So definitely put it by, uh, you know, when you can look out a window and see it. Uh, when you're putting up those bird feeders, um, we try and put them closer than three feet to a window or farther than 30 feet from the window. And that's to prevent those bird strikes. So if they're closer and they fly into the window, it's not going to hurt them too bad. If they're farther away, the feeder's farther away, they're less likely to run into the window in the first place. Uh, but then keep in mind, uh, you know, having some good escape cover nearby is always good. But if you're trying to avoid things like squirrels, again, get those feeders a little bit more out in the open is, is a good idea on a fairly long pole because they are a, a good jumper going straight up uh, as well as straight out. So, uh, but if squirrels do get out there, um, you know, definitely enjoy them. You can even feed the squirrels in a separate pile. And sometimes that draws the squirrels away from your bird feeder to those other areas. So there's, there are some options to hopefully uh, get fewer, uh, fewer of those squirrels out of your feeder. But my best advice is just enjoy any critter you get in your backyard. Hey, that's really great. I mean, they are nature's heist masters, those or them and those raccoons. So that's all great. But we are at our time. So as we end the live stream today, I would like to thank everyone that tuned in to be here with us live and also to those that may be finding this video a little bit later down the road. I want to, of course, give a special thank you to Austin, his entire team, as well as every naturalist out there helping give our natural world a voice. If you like today's program, please show support by giving us that thumbs up on the YouTube page. And if you'd like to know what we have coming up in the future and just want to stay in front of all of our live streams, just subscribe below and you'll be able to find all of our awesome videos from the past, as well as lives that have, or have early access to our lives that have yet to come. Our next live stream is going to be on January 4th at 1 p.m. Central with our local Dickerson Park Zoo. And January's theme is going to be all about adaptations. So make sure to tune in to hear about some of those crazy extreme organisms and what they have to help them survive in their natural world. As we sign off today, I, of course, want to challenge everyone to get outdoors and pick a conservation topic that you're not very familiar with and see what you can do to help protect this wild world we are so lucky to have all around us. This is Alex signing off. I can't wait to see you all next time. Stay wild.